here we are today on a mountain summit called the Twins it's in the Australian Alps near Mount Hotham panning around the summit we can see the pointy mountain of Mount Feathertop in the distance one of the highest peaks in Victoria when we think about how climate change might impact on alpine ecosystems we usually think about how temperatures will increase and this will allow species from lower altitudes to move to higher altitudes because the thermal limits for those species are now moving up slope. But in Australia I think there's an underappreciated driver of vegetation change in high mountain ecosystems that I want to talk about today. That driver is drought. Australian mountains are characterised by the fact that they have soils that cover their uh, peaks and as a consequence plants have the capacity to grow all the way from lower slopes to higher slopes and indeed over the tops of those peaks. Here we can see evidence of it on the twins where in the distance we've got some woodlands that have been burnt a few years ago on the right hand side and then beyond the tree line we can see shrubby vegetation, uh, the heathlands, grassy vegetation over the summit knoll and then down to the left grasslands that merge back into subalpine forest. So clearly soil plays a critical role in the distribution of some of these species allowing them to grow at altitudes in Australia that they perhaps wouldn't elsewhere where mountains are very rocky and there's no soil profile in which to develop. Soils on Australian mountains vary dramatically in depth. On some mountains uh, they can be quite deep. Very old mountains where the bedrock material denudes and organic matter accumulates to form rather deep profiles. Here on the twins we can see that the soils are rather skeletal. There's lots of rubble, uh, it's a shaley type uh, bedrock here, but we can see quite clearly that there's lots of soil. And in this particular soil gap here, we can see grasses establishing, uh, some herbs in particular uh, taking root, and they're trying to colonise this space. The depth of the soil profile is probably really critical in thinking about how plants respond to drought. Plants on southerly or easterly aspects tend to be protected from the hot afternoon sun, and indeed don't get much incident sunlight at all uh, in autumn and early spring. So they tend to remain quite green. As a consequence, these areas are exposed to less drought stress. By contrast, on westerly aspects, as we'll see in a moment, the sun beats down for much of the day and with transpiration and evaporation, the soil moisture in that soil is depleted through time. This means there are particular challenges for the plants that are trying to make a living there. Here we are on a westerly aspect and here productivity is lower. Moisture limits vegetation growth, presumably. The soils might even be a little bit shallower here because organic matter hasn't accumulated to the same degree as it does perhaps in more productive areas. So why is drought such a potential issue on Australian mountains? Well clearly soil depth is going to interact with aspect but it also must interact with frequency of rainfall. And on Australian mountains, frequency of rainfall is rather unpredictable. I'm standing on the Twins and we know that there hasn't been any rainfall in this region for the last two and a half weeks. In some cases, there have been recorded instances where there's been no rainfall in the Australian Alps for 50 continuous days. So water limitation becomes a key driver of plant demography, births, deaths, rates. We have evidence that shrubs on shallow soils on westerly aspects are particularly vulnerable to drought death when soil moisture uh, declines. This is an unusual phenomenon in many respects because in other mountain ecosystems water isn't a limiting factor. Temperature is. I suspect that's not so true in Australian mountains. So where's the evidence for drought death that might be impacting on individual species on Australian mountains? Here we have Poahothomensis, a species of grass that is found in relatively shallow soils around the Mount Hotham area. It's quite common. You can see there's evidence of browning of the leaf tips 
Indeed, the leaves are enrolled and they're not particularly green. One would argue that this plant's under some sort of drought stress. Looking at the plant just next to it is a type of heath, leucopogon. And what I can see is a yellowing of the leaves. Indeed, some of them are starting to turn brown. The leaves are enrolling. There's clearly evidence that this plant is starting to wilt. It's under stress. Perhaps interestingly, this species here, which is a non-native, it's a weed called Hypocarus radicata, is almost now completely dead. The leaves have shriveled up, it's wilted, uh, there's probably some potential for this plant not to recover when it does start raining. Now that might be because this species isn't very well adapted to this environment. It's certainly a perennial species, so we wouldn't normally expect this sort of behaviour this early in the season. It is only early January. So there's three cases where there is some evidence that we would suggest plants are under water stress. Let's see if we can't find some more. Here's two more examples of plants that are showing evidence of some sort of stress that I suspect is not due to temperature per se, but to water deficits. On the right, a little daisy called Brachyscomi, with the leaves wilting, shriveling up. The plant's flowered, and it's a perennial species, so it may well recover from this, but it clearly looks like that individual is suffering. In front of it, Scleranthus biflorus. Again, I can see the leaves very much are wilting, shriveling up. It's turning brown. Again, this plant has flowered, and maybe it will die because of this stress. But this is rather unusual. We don't normally see lots of individuals of different species en masse showing evidence of severe stress by wilting. Here we are on the eastern aspect, and we can see the plant uh, in the centre of our frame here, Poahothamensis again. Is a bright green, healthy, apparently non-stressed plant in this instance. Not much evidence that this plant is undergoing currently water with stress. Behind it, Grevillea australis, looking bright green, no evidence of stress. Again, on the eastern aspects where it's more sheltered, perhaps soils are better developed water is available for longer between rainfall events. Here's Brachus combing again and you can see this individual on a slightly different aspect on a soil mound is bright green. Not much evidence, if any, any that there's wilting, yellowing of the leaves. The plant's still flowering, looking rather healthy. So I think we can contrast plant species responses across aspects and learn a lot about the role that water, temp uh, water stress will play in their potential future persistence on mountaintops. Some species are showing very little evidence of stress currently, regardless of what aspect they're on. Here we have one of the shrubs, Potilobium alpestre, flowering quite uh, well and also looking unstressed. No evidence of wilting or leaf browning. So it's clear that the sensitivity of species to water stress is probably something to do with their plant, their traits. Shrubs in particular are often very deep rooted, so they might be able to access deep soil moisture. Species with low SLA, specific leaf area, are perhaps going to be more resilient in the face of water stress compared to those with high SLA and many of the species we've looked at today would be considered to have, for an alpine species, relatively high SLA. There will be other traits obviously uh, that will help uh, resist, or those species to resist water stress. You might want to think of what they are. Clearly that's one approach to understanding vegetation dynamics, linking vegetation responses to plant traits. And that's what I'll be doing here over the next few days, is collecting data on the traits of the leaves of these species, and then trying to find evidence that the species that seem to be undergoing stress through wilting, 
or as evidenced by wilting, are indeed those species with higher leaf traits such as SLA. So what do we conclude? Well, I think we need to think more about the role that not just temperature increases will play in alpine species distributions into the future, but the interaction with changes in rainfall. This involves something about not just the total amount of rainfall, but the frequency and intensity of those rain events. If it were to be that the frequency of rain were to decline regardless of the event uh, amount, one might think that on the western and northern slopes of mountain ecosystems there could be quite profound changes associated with drought stress rather than temperature stress per se. I think that probably is exacerbating the effect of drought, clearly, but one would suggest that its temperature alone is not the only driver of alpine vegetation change.